Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, we've been doing a series I've been doing on uh, different Catholic things of why do Catholics do that. Uh, the next topic in that series is actually going to be the sacraments and the sacramentals, but uh, as I looked at the handout and they were getting kind of large and stuff, I decided to break one part out of it uh, that I was originally going to cover in the sacraments overall and just kind of make it its own little mini class for those who are interested. Um, it's going to deal specifically with the idea of, of the, map, the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, as being really one of the foundational uh, sources for the Catholic Mass. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. It'll be a one-time class. It's a short six-page handout, so um, we'll look at that. I'll start with a little overview that I do have to give some overview of the book of Revelation and talk a little bit about it in general. Um, but then we'll get right to that specific slice that we're only looking at one little particular piece of this um, book. So with that, let's go ahead and begin as we do, always do in prayer. And closing our eyes and placing ourselves in the inner room that Christ our Lord taught us about. Where we can encounter the, our God face to face. And we just direct all of our attention, our mind and our heart towards the fact of his presence there with us, within us, and all around us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we come before you, Lord, and we ask for your grace in order to understand the words of your Apostle John that we may come to a deeper appreciation and understanding of the Mass, and having known it better, we may come to participate, it, participate in it ever more fervently. We ask all of this in, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, I'll, I'll pass out the handout. For my handouts, it's a small one, so you guys are lucky. Oh. Um, the background I'll do at the beginning, though, isn't in the handout. It's just a little bit of a puzzle. So the book of Revelation. I have done the whole book of Revelation once before. Those who knew me a long time ago at St. Timothy's, almost 18 years ago, I did the book of Revelation, but I probably never do it again, at least for a long time. Because that one took me a year, and it was a lot, it was hardcore. So, <laughs> and I had about a hundred people who came for a year straight because of that book. Every line that John writes, he refers to probably four or five scripture passages. So, his writing is so rich in and of itself; it's difficult. And Revelation kind of has this mystique and mis uh, mystery about it. Um, that's really a that's really a more modern day phenomenon. That is. It kind of arises in Protestantism, especially in the 1800s and stuff, this, this uh, reflection or looking at the end times in the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation itself actually isn't that difficult to understand. It has a pattern. It has themes. It has the images we're aware of. The only place where it's difficult is the exact separating from one event to another. Because what John does, and just to explain the book a little bit before, as, so we can get into it, is for a period of roughly 400 years, from 200 BC to 200 AD, you have this type of literature that arises, and it's called apocalyptic. Contrary you may be what we think, the word apocalyptic, now it's come to mean things in our English language like catastrophe and stuff. The word is just a genre. It's like saying the word novel or opinion. It's a type of writing uh, that's characterized by certain things that we'll talk about in a minute. Now, some of the things to um, realize about apocalyptic writing is all apocalyptic writing came to replace prophecy. Uh, those who were in the classes that I did a few weeks ago on the oral tradition in the Bible, there is a point in time in Israel's history where prophecy ceases. And even um, 
when we enter into the Christian era and we have the beginning of Jesus' ministry, which is, begins with John the Baptist, who is the last of the Hebrew prophets, um, prophecy after that point, although every Christian is baptized a, quote, priest, prophet, king, our prophecy is not that like exercised by the Old Testament prophets. That has sort of ceased for the, in the, for the world. It's no longer necessary. However, what you have in its place is something different where you have these men and women who experience what is called a mystical ascent. They are caught up or have the experience of being caught up into heaven, taken on this otherworldly journey to the heavenly realms where they are met with an, by an angel usually who then proceeds to tell them special information. He unveils, apocalypsis, revelatio, he unveils a glimpse into what, th what is really happening behind the scenes, so to speak, in the world of the spirit. Um, and you see this throughout the Old Testament. This is an Old Testament idea. Uh, the prophet Micaiah, uh, Isaiah is caught up and sees the angels and, they, and is brought before God's throne. Ezekiel is caught up into the divine throne and the cherubim. St. Paul is caught up to the third heaven, caught up to paradise. He talks about this experience. John's whole revelation is that experience, this experience of being caught up into heaven. And um, in this understanding, some of the things we need to, to recognize about how the ancient world understood the apocalypse or apocalyptic things. The first one, that we get wrong as modern people, is apocalyptic writing is present time. Here's what John says in the very beginning. Um, the very first verse of Revelation, and you don't have to keep turning there because I'm only going to touch on this a little bit right at the beginning, but... John is very clear. He repeats it multiple times, and yet we read John, and then we do exactly the opposite of what he says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must happen soon. He made known by sending his angel to his servant John. So there you have the angel connected. Blessed, blessed is the one who reads aloud, and blessed are those who listen to this prophetic message and heed what is written in it, for the appointed time is near. And if you go to the very end, the last verses of Revelation, he reiterates that again. Um, I warn everyone who hears the words of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described, and if anyone takes away, God will take away from him the tree of life. The one who gives this testimony says, I am coming soon. Come, Lord Jesus. We know the, the one is coming soon. So over and over, it's this idea of coming soon. This is hard for us to grasp, even as Christians in the modern time, of what Jewish thinking kind of consisted of in the first century. Um, when Jesus is doing his very first statement, his very first teaching, Mark summarizes it in, I think it's one verse, it might be two. Now is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. That's Jesus in a nutshell, and that's where Mark gives us the first words spoken by Christ in his gospel. The word time there, used by Jesus, we don't have a word for it. In Greek, it's kairos. It's, like I said, we don't have a word for it. The best we can kind of come up with is the moment of opportunity. See, Greek has another word of which we're very familiar with, but that's not the one used. Chronos. I just forget the word chronology. That's seconds, minutes, days, hours, etc. Um, in the same way, think back to the Last Supper. Do this in memory of me. And as Catholics, we teach that every time we celebrate that Lord's Supper, it is not re-sacrificing Jesus, but it is in some way, mystically, by God's power, a reparticipation in the exact same event over and over again. 
That's what we mean by present time. The present time to the Jew is when it's God's time. It's when everything comes together as one. Um, the present, the future are all right there, right? And that's what we say at the Mass. We enter into that time period at the Mass. In the old translation, before they did the um, revised the, the Missal a decade ago or so, you probably recall the mystery of faith, one of the most popular ones used. Mystery of faith. Christ has died, past. Christ is risen, present. Christ will come again, future. See, in the Mass, all time is brought into one moment. That's kind of how the apocalyptic thinkers are coming from. And that's another part that's very difficult for us to grasp, and that is Jewish people, at least ancient Jews, Old Testament and New Testament, do not write history like us. They write from the perspective of what is God's plan in what's happening. So because of that, there might be, from the human perspective, huge world events that are happening right around Judaism, maybe right next door in Egypt or something, that we've documented for hundreds of years or thousands of years. They don't even mention. Why? Because, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of show, but in God's plan, it's really not very important. And then you'll have events that the rest of the world doesn't even know occurred, and yet God is working so powerfully in there, so... So Jews write history trying to see it from God's point of view. And in this world view where they're caught up, um, and I, I, I don't have time to go into their cosmology, we'll talk about that when we talk about purgatory. So I'll just very briefly outline it. Paul alludes to the fact that he assumes we should know things we no longer know. Like he, when he says, I'm caught up to the third heaven, first of all, most of us read past it and don't even catch it. Those of us who do catch it, we're like, third heaven, and then you kind of go on to breakfast or whatever, right? But three heavens? What, what is Paul talking about, right? Well, the word shamaim, heaven, or oranos in Greek, um, is used in a lot of ways in the Bible. Hebrew is an interesting language. I talked about this last week, we talked, or a couple weeks ago, when we talked about the Bible. Um, the Hebrew language, every letter represents a sound, a um, number, and even a concept. But the vocabulary itself is very limited because they don't have any vowels, they don't have things like that. But what they can do is they transpose the same letter, read it backwards, frontwards, and they get all kinds of different meanings. So for example, the word nahash means worm, snake, dragon, sea monster, right? It's all on the context of what you're reading. In the same vein, shemaim means a lot of things. Shemaim means the air we breathe and our, what we would today call our atmosphere. Yeah, that's one type of heaven. One would be outer space, and we still use that phrase, right? The heavens. Even in our modern technological time, we still refer to the heavens out there. And then beyond that, though, are these spiritual realms. Because the way Judaism looks at the creation is it's always in these groups of three, which I'm only going to roughly touch on. So our entire universe, part of which is physical and is entirely intertwined with that which is spiritual, is, the, is in, in terms of experiencing God's presence, is the furthest you can get from him. The furthest you can get from him. Because beyond this existence are more. Paul mentions three. There's actually a few more, but we don't need to understand them that much. This would be the first heaven Paul mentions, the second heaven, the third heaven. The first heaven is that of the, um, is the, the primary angelic world, the world of the angels and spiritual things. That's where they exist. The second heaven is the place of uh, paradise, where the Garden of Eden now resides. And the third one is where the throne of God is. 
So when Paul tells his story, he's not trying to impress anyone in the sense of his experience, which was actually common. That seems to have been the common early Christian teaching on how to do this. Today we call it contemplation, how to enter into these spiritual states. But he's doing it because he assumes everyone knows what he's talking about. When he says, I was caught up to the third heaven, he's not saying that to impress people that he was caught up there. He's saying it to make clear that the gospel is real. That is, what he's saying is, because I was caught up to the throne of God, God himself, the message, the gospel, is from God's own lips, right? It's the truth. It wasn't given to me by an angel or a prophet or any earthly being. It was its own. Um, not to further confuse it, but has anyone ever heard the term the seven heavens? Yeah, you hear the term. We don't know where it arises from. In the spiritual realm, which are not these three worlds, there are seven heavens, but that's not where we go when we, quote, die or anything like that. There are spiritual realms of the angels that are part of this universe. Each universe has their own beings that live there, with the seraphim being the only ones who exist here by nature, the highest level creatures. So in these experiences, what happens is the person is called forth, and depending on what God is doing with them, they may be called to a different level. Some not, never see anything more than the angels, that would be Zechariah. If you look through Zechariah's visions, he has angels that accompany him everywhere, but he never sees anything beyond it. Some see paradise. Paul saw paradise. Um, Isaiah sees paradise, a few others. Most of them see what's called the, quote, the divine throne. So, and we're going to see right at the beginning of Revelation, that's what John sees is this throne. So... The one thing is you have to kind of wrap your head around the fact that when John is talking about this, so when he says a vision, he doesn't mean what we mean nowadays, like I had some kind of cool mental experience. No, John means he is literally in some sense caught up to enter into a place that no human being is ever allowed to go except after being glorified after death. And so from there, you learn the most special things you can possibly like understand. So one is time. Most of what Revelation dictates is based on the time it's written. And John uses a series of four cycles of seven events. So you'll see this pattern repeat itself. Seven. Uh, a seven seals of a book, seven trumpets blown, each in succession, seven chalices filled with blood poured forth on the earth. And there's these four cycles that he goes through. And in those cycles, what are the real life things he's talking about? Because that's what we have to recognize to be able to understand what he's talking about. Well, on one hand, he's referring to four emperors whose Actions and lives greatly impacted the early church. So you have Nero, who ruled from 54 to 68. You have Vespasian, who was Nero's general and had begun the Jewish war. And then when Nero killed himself, Vespasian raced back, killed any, any competition, and became emperor. He would rule from... Uh, uh, 68 to 79. His son Titus, who he would send back to complete the Jewish war, uh, would rule after him as emperor from 79 to 81. And then Domitian is the emperor in whose time period John is himself writing. And he ruled from 81 to 96. Sometime around the year 90 three, we believe, Domitian began a, um, the sec what's called the second great persecution of the church. The first one had begun under Nero, Nero um, but since the year 68, it had been 25 years since the Roman Empire had could care less about Christians. 
And so it broke out suddenly, it was unexpected. Because it was unexpected and because there had been 25 years of really non-aggression, most Christians were well known to their neighbors, it wasn't hidden. And so Domitian ended up killing a lot of them. And that's why John is writing during this persecution as it's going on or right around the time, because we hear that he's in exile on Patmos. Now why he was allowed exile rather than death, we don't know. He wasn't a Roman citizen, but for whatever reason, he was exiled. Um, anyone ever been to Patmos? I haven't been there either, but I know it's a beautiful place. It looks out on the Aegean. If you go there today, you can see the cave where he lived with one soldier um, for those years he was there. And so um, what we have in the book of Revelation is four emperors, and then those four emperors in turn point us towards, I say four events, it's really three historical events and then another special event. In the reign of these four men, three huge events also occur that will have huge implications for the church. The first one is the great persecution under Nero. That's with the burning of Rome and the emperor comes up with a scapegoat and it becomes the Christians. Um, and in that great persecution, Paul is killed, Peter is martyred, uh, many, many Christians die in that first one, especially of the apostles. The second one was the Jewish war, which isn't directly connected to any particular emperor. It starts under Nero. Nero. It is first carried out by Vespasian, but then he comes home to become emperor. And then after he solidifies his power, he allows Titus, who was an emperor at the time, to go forth and finish it. And so the Jewish war would be huge because it would end with the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the killing of most of the priests, and the exile of the people out of the Holy Land until 1948. It's a huge event. At the same time, Christians saw it as another proof that Jesus was really the Messiah, right? Because he predicted it to the date. In one generation, 40 years, this place will be knocked to the ground. Happened in 70 AD, Jesus said that in 30 to 33 AD at the latest. So within 70 year, 40 years, he was right. And then finally, the one they're undergoing now is the second persecution under Domitian. Now the event that's not a historical one per se in the same way, or at least is not something that's happening in that time period, um, has to do with the Last Judgment. And so the type of things that John sees are very similar. Like when you, if you were to look through some of the other prophets and stuff I'm mentioning and look at what they talk about, you're going to find a lot of what John says is the same kind of stuff. Another important thing to keep in mind other than the fact that it's present-oriented, doesn't mean it doesn't have something it's telling us about the future, he certainly does. But other than the fact it's primarily present time, the other thing we get rid of, uh, wrong as modern people is that apocalyptic writing is meant to be symbolic, not literal. It only becomes weird in the 1800s when people from a very black and white literal society, the United States, now read the Bible literally. See, no one who read Revelation when John wrote it would have thought the moon's really going to fall out of the sky. First of all, it can't. It's not in any sky to fall out of. So the same images are used over and over, so they have meaning. They're traditional. And John did not think that these literal things were going to happen. He's describing what's occurring spiritually behind the scenes by assigning to earthly realities the spiritual symbol symbolism. And that's true of all apocalyptic writings. Daniel, as you read through him, and the seven beasts, and the different creatures he, he, uh, he uses. So what are some examples? What, well, when John talks about falling stars, the understanding is, is in the beginning of time, or human time, God assigned every people, now we don't know what is meant by that, Right? Ethnicity, nation, we're not sure, just says people, 
are assigned an angel who oversees them. So every place has an angel. That's why Catholics today dedicate countries to saints, right? The Blessed Virgin in our case, the Immaculate Conception in the United States, other places. Um, it goes back to this idea. Now at a certain point, however, most of those angels rebelled. And that's why you had the situation that arises early after Genesis. And at that point, God decides he'll do what he had never planned to do, or he always planned, but never pretended to plan to do to the angels, and that is he would choose a people himself. And he had to pull them from other people in order to make his own people. So that's the story of Israel. At a certain point, however, in the book of Psalms, it tells us that one day God will judge those angels who have fallen away from what they were supposed to do. They've led the nations astray. They've become little, quote, G-gods. They've done these things. And so whenever you hear about falling stars, stars always refer to angels. John even tells us, he says he held seven stars in his hand. Then he goes, parentheses, by the way, those seven stars are the seven angels to the churches I'm writing to. So um, the, it's, you know, we shouldn't look for celestial things to actually occur and think it's the end of time. Because the other thing is this. What they mean by the end of time is not what we mean. The end of time is not the end of the time-space continuum. That's not what the church teaches or Judaism. Time will still continue after the second coming. It will simply be transformed because now God will reign on heaven as he does on earth. It'll all be united. That diagram I drew before of the concentric circles, they'll all be one. That's why we still have bodies. You can't exist in a body outside of no time. The only thing that doesn't exist in time is God. Even those in heaven now exist in time. It's just not time as we experience it here, but it's still time. So, you know, when, when we talk about the end and things like this, we often don't really grasp what we're talking about. Now, what are some of the Jewish themes that are really big that John hits on? One is the temple as the model of all creation. Um, in that model I showed you of ancient Judaism of the circles, I said there were, there were additional levels. But those levels can't be reached by human beings, and so in a sense they're irrelevant to us in that sense. Above that third heaven are two more things. There's a blackness that can't be pierced by human beings, and that's called tohu comes from the first verses of Genesis. It's what God creates things out of, right? There, the earth was void and nothing. Tohu wobohu. That's the thing of, that's nothingness, right? Human beings can't go beyond that place. And above that, the Jews had a very interesting uh, idea. The highest level of created reality created reality, right? Beyond that, beyond all reality is God, who's infinite beyond anything. The highest level of created um, reality is called Adam Kadmon. It literally means primordial or primal man. Right? The word Adam means man. Now, why that should be interesting to us is because it tells us long before the incarnation, Jews still understood that the first model, that's the model which all the other stuff is made through. God's original blueprint was in the form of a man. Isn't that interesting? That's what Paul and them are talking about when they say, oh, and now we know who it is. It's Jesus. So you have everything was made in him, through him, for him, with him. He's the source of all that is. Um, God made nothing apart from him. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. So, in the beginning, the model of the temple is, the Word is the model of everything God exists. And then if we had time, which we don't here, you would go through the story of creation, and you would see that the whole created universe is meant to be a temple. Right? The universe is depicted as being a temple. The earth is described in terms of being an altar. The um, celestial stars are the liturgical calendar. You have the Sabbath worship introduced by God into creation. You have um, 
the uh, Eden is like the Holy of Holies, the place where God is present in a special way on earth. You have um, Adam being the priest mediator who can name the creatures, who has dominion, who has power. Uh, you have just all these things over and over that, that points to the fact that um, even the process of creation is a liturgical procession, right, which we should all be familiar with as, as Catholics. It comes from Israel. Right? Every Mass, we stand up, and what starts? Everyone starts walking down the aisle. First the crucifix usually, then the book or the candles, then the book carried by the deacon if he's present, and then ultimately last comes the priest because he represents Christ. That's the story of creation. It's not trying to tell us anything about reality of how God did the process, like evolution or otherwise. He's trying to tell us a spiritual statement. So first you have the less important things come into being, and then each thing comes into being, one after another. And the last thing to, quote, march into the universe is humanity. Why? Because they're the image of God. So creation is supposed to be a temple, and it has three parts, as, as all temples in the ancient world had three rooms. Well, then we move forward, because like I said, I can't really do this, and um, we discover that Moses will be given directions on how to build the Jewish tabernacle and temple as a model. And he's supposed to model it on what he sees in heaven. That's Moses. And then by the time we get to Jesus, we see that Jesus is is there to reveal to us that he is the temple, right? (laughs) That's what he got killed for in the end. One of his statements is, I'll destroy this temple in three days and I'll rebuild it. And, And John tells us he meant his body. He doesn't mean the physical building. Jesus is the temple. And then Paul turns to us and he says, and because we're all part of him, right? We're stones built in the big rock that's Peter. And then that rock is part of the rock that is Christ. We're all temples as well. Paul calls us a temple of the Holy Spirit. Because just like the temple, we have three parts. So the temple in Jerusalem had the outer court. And that's the outside place where everyone, any Jewish person, I should say, qualified. Non-Jews weren't allowed in at all. They were outside here in the Gentile court. The outer court was any Jew could enter into that area. And only two big things were there. There was a huge tank of water called the sea, which you would clean yourself before and after sacrifices. And then there was the large... Um, altar of, of sacrifice, the, the um, bronze altar. Then you had this building inside the courtyard, which we call the tabernacle. But the tabernacle had two parts. The first part is called the holy place, and the priests were allowed within. And the holy place had the menorah. The holy place had... Um, the little table with, sh- with the little showbread, the bread that was eaten every Saturday or, um, by the priest, which is foretelling the Eucharist. And it had a little altar, which sacrifice was not made on. It was only for incense. The only time that altar was used in any form of animal sacrifice is the animals were killed on Yom Kippur, and the priest brought in just, the high priest brought in just enough blood to touch the four corners of the altar. And then beyond that, you had the Holy of Holies. And only one thing was in there, the ark. The lid of which was covered with the two huge cherubim statues hanging over it. So see, the temple itself was built purposely to reflect what creation looks like. The outer court was decorated with images of trees and animals and um, all the things of earth. When you got into this one, it was decorated on the sides with images of the sun, the moon, the stars, and all these celestial things. And when you got in here, there was no decoration except the ark, but the presence of the cherubim made it clear that you had now entered into the heavenly place. So the, the temple itself is supposed to look like creation, which was the original temple. Now, how are we temples? Well... The Bible says that a human person is described of three aspects. I don't say parts because they're not separate, but aspects. We have our outer court, which is our body. 
We have our holy place, which is our soul. And then we have the holy of holies, which is our spirit. So when Paul says, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit, he doesn't mean that symbolically. <laughs> he means it literally. You are literally like the temple. Three parts, and you have the presence of God himself in you. So what is this temple imagery you're going to see? And that, that's what we'll talk most about. Now, a couple other things, and let's move on to Revelation, is there's another concept called as above, so below. That's not its technical term, but that's <laughs> what we generally refer to it, so it's easy to understand, because that pretty much explains it. What does that mean? Well, that means um, that everything in the physical material universe has a corresponding spiritual reality that interacts with it, always. Secondly, it means that every thought, word, and action by persons, which is human beings and angels, um, has spiritual repercussions. And likewise, things that occur in heaven have heavenly consequences. Therefore, everything we do either furthers or hinders God's work in this world so that everything becomes important. And it's important to realize that's why there's, that's the whole idea of the communion of saints, which we're going to see in a big part of the union of those in purgatory, of those in heaven and those on earth, all united, working as one towards God's work. Um, finally, let's see. Well, the last thing is, the other one is called, there's also a, a, a better term for this, but Jew first, then Gentile. This comes from throughout the story. And the idea is this. Everything God does, he always does to his chosen people first. Right? They always have priority, period. That was what God did the first time he created Israel. It's what he did when he sent Jesus. If you remember Jesus, during his lifetime, what did he tell them? Do not go to any Gentile, but only to the lost tribes of Israel. And so Jesus, that was his own idea, is that you went to the Jews first, the Gentiles would have their time. And that was even the, the plan that Jesus laid out for the Jews, or for the church. At Pentecost, he tells them to follow the pattern of King David. He says, go to Jerusalem, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. Then from Jerusalem, um, go out into Judea, that's Judah, then into um, Samaria, that's the other ten tribes of Israel, and then till the ends of the earth, the Gentiles. So what that means in the book of Revelation is this. If we want to know what the, end, the pattern of the end of the world will be like, not exactly piece by piece, but the general pattern, then we need to look at Israel's history that'll teach us and so when we look for example on uh, what happened to is Egypt when it tried to keep Israel enslaved and we have these ten plagues that fall upon it we should believe that those plagues in some way are the inspiration for what will God will do to the pagan nations at the end of the time of world right? to free the church just as he freed Israel and when it comes to Israel, how did God punish Israel's own sin when they sinned? Because that's exactly the way he's going to act with the church to purify them in the end as well. So it's not going to be an exact, exact for exact thing, but it's going to be pattern. It's going to be similar. And that's why, um, that's where Revelation becomes difficult, because in one book, John is talking about Nero's persecution, the whole Jewish war, Domitian's persecution, and the end of the world, and he never tells you which one or which ones he's talking about at any given point. So some may apply to all four, some may apply to three, some to two, some only to one. And so that's where the mystery lies, that we can't ever be certain about this or that thing, but this is the pattern he's bringing forth. Um, and the last thing is what's called a, um, uh, not a universal, a, um, 
uh, corporate, corporate personality. This is also important for Jewish concepts. Jew first, then Gentile, corporate personality, as above, so below. These are all Jewish things that Christianity kind of brings to the forefront. Corporate personality very simply is this. In history, God gives certain people authority over different groups, from a family to a nation to the priesthood to whatever, to a whole covenant. And in some way, that individual person passes on their traits, good and bad, spiritual traits, sins and virtues, characteristics and such, to everyone that they're in charge of. Right? We know this right from the beginning. Adam. Adam sinned. We all suffer the consequences, period because we're part of Adam's group. There's no escaping it. The Old Testament people are named Israel after an event. Jacob, who's renamed Israel, wrestles an angel, and he's named Israel. What does Israel mean? He who wrestles with God. So what is the history of Israel forever? They will never be at peace with God always be a tug of war back and forth. But then when he renames for the new covenant, he has Simon is renamed Peter, which means what? The rock. Right? The church will not fail in what it's meant to do. It will not have the same relationship with God that Israel had. And, um, and so on and so forth. So that's important because you're going to see like the Virgin Mary and people who appear in the book of Revelation, and you need to recognize it's talking about them individually but you also have to realize they also represent something more than that. See, John saw himself as one of those, right? In his gospel, how does he refer to himself as? The beloved apostle. And so at the end of the story, Jesus tells us, woman, behold your son, son, behold your mother. Now, literally, yes, John takes care of her until she passed away and was assumed. However, John who experienced that event and is writing about it now, also understands that what Jesus did for him with Mary is meant for every Christian. John realizes he's a corporate personality. Not only did he do that to me literally, it means every single one of you and I is a daughter or son of the Blessed Virgin. So that's the whole idea of this corporate personality. With that, let's look at the mass, the handout. I'm only going to cover a little slice of the story, right? We're not going to get into all this history and everything else. We're just going to look at one piece of the mystery of Revelation, and that is when you and I celebrate the Mass or any of the sacraments, the liturgy of the church, the church teaches from Judaism on that we are actually drawn into that heavenly angelic worship and participate in it. So, for example, the first... Uh, statement I have here on page one comes from the catechism and it actually comes from the second Vatican council that the catechism just re re reprints but here's what it says it says in the earthly liturgy right when we go to mass and do everything we share a foretaste of that heavenly liturgy which is celebrated in the holy city of Jerusalem not Jerusalem on earth heavenly Jerusalem toward which we journey as pilgrims where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now, where do we get such a weird idea, right? I mean, except for the Orthodox, no other Christian church teaches that when they do their religious stuff that they're literally in heaven, so to speak. So where do we get it? Well, we first get it from Israel. In the covenant at Mount Sinai, Moses was given a vision of the heavenly temple where, he was the, where the Lord dwells, he saw images and he was supposed to do everything according to it. Now, I, I didn't mention the first part where he has that experience. I give you some quotes afterwards, though, but I'll read it really quick. It's from Exodus chapter 24, and it's the ratification of the covenant. We're told after they ratify the covenant, they pour the blood on the people, they make the promise, they sign the book, at that point then, Moses and others are called up, a select group, to the top of the mountain. 
So verse 9 of chapter 24, Exodus. Moses then went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, that's Aaron's two sons, and 70 elders of Israel. And they beheld the God of Israel, right? the beatific vision. They saw him in whatever that consisted of that they were allowed to see. Now, how do we know they've left Sinai? Under his feet, God's feet, there appeared to be what was like sapphire tile work as clear as the sky, and they describe what he's there. Well, when we see the book of Revelation, that's what John sees, and that's what the other prophets see. So they're in, quote, heaven, heaven on earth in some way. They're connected. They're at the top of Sinai. And then we're told, yet God did not lay a hand on these chosen Israelites. They were allowed to see God, and they ate and drank there. Notice the meal aspect. They eat. That's what they do when they see God. And so think of the Eucharist a lot later. But we find out later that Moses got a lot more information than that tiny little three verses tells us. So for example, I just give you three out of like nine different times this phrase or basic phraseology occurs. Moses, while he was up there, is given a vision of this heavenly temple and God tells Moses to model everything of worship that after what he saw. And he repeats this a lot of times. I only gave you three of, this, of the verses. There's quite a few more, just to make the point. Quote, They are to make a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell in their midst, according to all that I show you regarding the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furnishings, so you are to make it. Right? Make every piece from the smallest to the whole tent, exactly as I tell you. Well, how will he do that? Then he, we have a few more examples. You shall set up the tabernacle according to its plan, which you were shown on the mountain. Make the altar itself in the form of a hollow box, just as it was shown you on the mountain, and so on and so on. So Israel believes, and believes to this day, that everything from the whole tabernacle to the ark to all the pieces in it down to the bowl of washing was dictated directly by God as an image, a copy of what Moses saw in heaven. And the church accepts that. In the book of Hebrews, here's what the Christian author, who's Jewish, writes near the bottom of page one. They, non-Christian Jews, they worship in a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, as Moses was warned when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For he says, see that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So he says the Jews of his time that he's writing still worship in a building and, a, and with objects that are modeled after what Moses saw in heaven. However, he's actually demeaning it because he uses purposeful terms to, to sort of denigrate it. He does. A copy and a shadow. Right? It's not the real thing. It's an imitation. The point is, is something has happened between Israel and Catholicism, or the church. And what has happened, the big difference, is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit has connected us to God in such an intimate way in the incarnation of Christ, and therefore to the Father and all those who came before us, that what Israel was only able to partially accomplish, because it lacked the Spirit as a whole people, only prophets and certain persons were given the, quote, Holy Spirit, the church, although it follows the same pattern, for the church it's not a pattern. For the church, it's the real thing. Where they're doing in imitation of what's in heaven, we are actually participating in heaven. And the same author then will tell us that afterwards. He says, if you turn the page, it's a long, it's a long quote, but we're only going to look at some of the bold parts. First he tells the Christians what they are not experiencing. So that's why he says it starts because I'm on a negative. You have not. You have not approached that which could, not be, could be touched and a blazing fire, glooming darkness, a storm, and a trumpet blast, 
and a voice speaking words that those who heard begged that the message be, fur no fur be further addressed to them. No message. What's he referring to? Sinai. The smoke on the mountain, the thunder blast, the blazing fire, God's voice that so terrified Israel, they told God, or they told Moses, we don't want God to talk to us directly. In other words, what they said is, we don't want the Spirit. You go, and then you tell us what God said. That's not quite as terrifying. So they chose. They were allowed. Originally, God said, everyone can come up the mountain. Israel said, not going to do it. Well, he says, that's not what you've experienced. So now drop down to the next bold part. No, you, Christians, you have approached Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And what's there? Countless angels in festal gathering, the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, God, the judge of all, the spirits of the just made perfect, and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Right? They were afraid to go and see God face to face, but you aren't. Right? By the Spirit, you enter into the heavenly Jerusalem, what they were unwilling to do as a people. Then the end, therefore, we who are receiving the unshakable kingdom should have gratitude with which we should offer worship pleasing to God in reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. See, that is why if you look at the Mass, there's a certain point in the Mass at which this occurs. I mean, in a sense, where God is always present, of course, just as he was to Israel too. But in the Mass, there's a certain point. Just prior to the invocation of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts, so that Jesus becomes present, notice how the Spirit is even the reason Jesus is present. He doesn't make himself present. He has to be called down. By the power of the Holy Spirit, this may become the body and blood of our Lord. Now, right before that, there's something we always do. And that is the point at which we recognize that something in the Mass has shifted from simply being us on earth reaching towards heaven to heaven having finally now entered our space, so to speak. And that is the, the um, angelic hymn. There are about 52 variations because every preface of a mass has a slightly different one, but they all have the same pattern and you'll recognize it as soon as I read one. The priest says, lift up your hearts. So there's some corda, right? And that's what John hears, lift up. And we respond, we lift them up to the Lord. Then he says, see, we're lifting them up. Like John was caught up to heaven, we're asking the Spirit to lift us now. He's going to bring Jesus down to us and bring us to Jesus, kind of a meeting of everything together there. And then he says this, With all the thrones, angels, archangels, dominions, and all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing of your glory as without end we acclaim. And then together we all sing, Holy, 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 the Sanctus. That is the song that is sung in heaven by the angels. First seen by Isaiah, chapter 6, the seraphim sing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, continuously. John sees it again in the Revelation. And at that moment, we are literally joined to the heavenly liturgy. Not as spectators, not from a distance, they're there. Right? The angels, the saints, Christ himself, the Spirit, all our dead Brothers and sisters who are in the heavenly realms, they're all there with us. We are not imitating what the angels do. Notice the priest says we're saying it with them. We're right together worshiping God, heaven and earth, united in that moment as God will one day unite it at the second coming when he literally brings everything together as one. And so the Mass is this moment in time where heaven and earth actually touch each other and God becomes all in all. Uh, right? You take the Eucharist, God's in you, like all these things. So in describing the whole book, the catechism, the Catholic catechism goes on and it makes a statement. It actually has a lot more, but I don't want to include them all because it would bog us down too much. But at the bottom of page two, you see um, that the church makes this statement about what we're going to see. What are we going to see in the book of Revelation? The book of Revelation, read in the church's liturgy, first reveals to us a throne, then it shows a lamb. It presents the water of life. 
which is the Holy Spirit. It shows all those, the heavenly powers, all creation, the servants of the old and new covenants, the new people of God, the martyrs slain for the word of God, the holy mother of God, and the great multitude which no one could count. Now the last line. It is in this eternal liturgy that the Spirit and the Church enable us to participate whenever we celebrate the mystery of salvation in the sacraments. Every sacrament is a participation in this heavenly liturgy. So that is why what John saw becomes the foundation for our Mass. When John is first called up to heaven, he witnesses four things. He sees an altar under which, interestingly enough, are the martyrs, because that's where blood would flow from a sacrifice, so they're underneath the altar, the martyrs. But he sees an altar. He sees a throne upon which is God, who's indescribable. He's just like a light. But also on the throne, he sees a lamb. And it's a very strange lamb. He was clearly, he has a mortal wound, but he's alive. And then finally, he sees a book. Now, these four things, therefore, since the first century when John wrote until the modern times, those four things characterize what must be present in a Catholic place of worship. From the smallest chapel to the largest cathedral, there must be an altar. There must be the throne, that's the priest chair. Now, the priest chair is actually representative of the bishop who he serves throne. And what's the name of the bishop's church? Is always called a what? Cathedral. Cathedral. The word cathedra means chair. It's the place of the bishop's chair who represents God sitting on the throne, in the liturgy of heaven, at the altar. Uh, that's also why, if the church is doing it liturgically correct, the deacon just sits on the little flat thing without a back. That's where we get the term deacon's bench, to make clear that they're not priestly. <laughs> the lamb, well, we, there must be a crucifix, that is, it must have a body on it in the sanctuary. Most churches have one already behind the altar, a big one usually. Then if not, one is to be carried up in procession and kept in that sanctuary area. Most churches have both, right? Like here and most churches I know of, you have the one in the back and then on Sundays, one is also carried up as well. So you have the crucifix. And then finally the book. Well, you have the ambo from where the word is to be read. Now, liturgically speaking, and I'm not gonna, don't wanna get anyone in trouble, but liturgically speaking, at that ambo, only two things are to be done ever. The scripture's read, which includes the cantor with the psalm, because that's scripture, and the homily. You are not supposed to read announcements or anything else from that ambo. That should be done at another microphone or place. Because the bingo night and my Bible study and everything else are nice, but they're not the word of God, right? And they shouldn't be shown as coming from the sanctuary. Only God's word and its interpretation should ever be said from there. And that's where, of course, the lectionary sits, the book. So every Catholic church has to have this. Um, and so when you go from church to church, you can start to look, right, and see, do they have all the stuff they're supposed to? Yeah, they do. And it all comes from the book of Revelation. Now, the second thing that John gives us, it's very interesting, is Revelation, at least as we divide it, John didn't have it divided per se, but it's been divided, um, is divided pretty neatly into two parts. And I'll finish this, then we'll take our break. The first part all has to do with uh, seven letters that are read and written, written and read and proclaimed. You have a seven sealed book that one by one, the 
seals are broken and more and more things begin to happen in earth and on the earth in human history. And a few things like this. Then in the next chapters, you have the tree of life appear. You have the mana from the desert. And you have chalices filled with blood, right? Eucharistic. In other words, when you step back and look at John's, the whole structure of his book, it's the mass. Liturgy of the word, followed by the liturgy of the Eucharist. First, he prepares us by writing letters, reading them, proclaiming them. Then he sees the first thing that happens in heaven when he gets to the heavenly place is the book is there. Only Christ can open the book. And as each, as each seal is broken, more and more of the understanding of God's plan and his word is revealed to the people. And only after that is all accomplished, then we start to see the images of the tree of life that's going to become our, our thing, the hidden manna that will be given, the chalices of blood that are poured out on the earth, all this Eucharistic imagery. Now, if only John did that, we could say, people would say, oh, that's really cool, but that might just be circumstantial or a coincidence. Well, it's actually found in a lot of different writings in the, Old, in the New Testament, but I'll just give one more example. If you go down on page 3 to the last footnote, 18, the exact same pattern is found in the Gospel of Luke, which means it can't, it, when you have it enough times, it can't be accidental. Different authors, different writings, etc. And that's the story of going to Emmaus. So you remember the story, the two disciples are discouraged, they've left Jerusalem, Jesus is dead, therefore they think he's not the Messiah, although they had hoped he was. Jesus appears to them without revealing who he is, and he talks to them. And what does he do? Well, first he does the liturgy of the word. Quote, then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all of the scriptures. So much so later, when they're talking about it, they say, were not our hearts burning within us when he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? And they're so excited about this man who's sharing all this stuff that when they, they get there, he pretends like he's going to keep going forward, and they beg him to stay, so he stays, and they have a meal. And then in the exact same words of the Last Supper, we hear this. And it happened that while he was at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. Once they receive it, with that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they run all the way back, if you remember, to Jerusalem to tell the others what's happened to them. And we're told, quote, Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. So the whole story of Emmaus is also the Mass. First you have the Liturgy of the Words, you understand what's going on. Then you celebrate it with the Liturgy of the Eucharist about what's happening or what you're what. Uh, you're manifesting what you've just learned about in the readings. So let's go ahead and we'll take our break. We'll come back and we'll look at the, a, a few more things that start to build up more and more what's going on here. <laughs> he's, he's not busy doing much, so I don't know why he can't do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is interesting. Um, if, it is interesting. There's one, it's, it's, like sometimes you can pick out when he does things historically directly. Well, Nero's an easy one because Nero's the Antichrist, not Domitian. Nero adds up to 666. Also, Nero was loved by the common people. Uh, the, I know he was crazy, but the senators and stuff hated him, but the common people loved him. And so after his death, the rumor spread that he was not really dead and coming back. And so that's why the Antichrist is wounded, seems to be dead, but comes back. and. So that's Nero. Now one for the destruction of the temple is interesting because on the surface it would look like it's not history because he talks about when God's spirit leaves the temple and the moment that happens, there's no way the Jews can, can rebuff the Roman attack. Once God withdraws his protection, there's no way, humanly speaking, that army is going to beat the other one. Um, but what's interesting is if you take that event 
And then you read um, the Jewish war by the Jewish historian Josephus, who was a Jew fighting in that war and then got captured and then became a Roman <laughs> to save his life and then wrote a history of it. And then if you read the Roman historian Tacitus, who knows nothing about Jesus or anything, accounting it, they all say the same thing. John tells us that God left the thing. Josephus tells us people present within Jerusalem heard a voice and the doors of the temple flung open and no one was in it. The Roman, who has no idea of what Jews and Christians believe, says, we outside saw gods dancing, like angels probably, but we saw gods in the atmosphere above them leaving and we knew victory was ours. Like it was really, so three people account the same event who are not in contact with each other, don't like each other, and are coming from completely different backgrounds, religions, etc. It's kind of interesting the the stuff there that, that comes up. But okay, now you have to talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to the whole structure of Revelation, uh, and I'm really just giving you surface level stuff. There's uh, it's hard to find in one place because the fathers of the church write about it a lot, but they're all dispersed and they can be very difficult to read. Um, Scott Hahn did one of his first books years ago is the, Sup the Lamb Supper or the Supper of the Lamb. If you want to see this in more detail, just the part about the mass in Revelation, that's a good book. But I can only kind of scratch the surface even of that part. However, let's look at the other references that make it clear that ultimately Revelation is a liturgical document. The first thing is it occurs on Sunday, the Lord's Day. Now, Sunday had been adopted by the church very early on as the day they celebrated the resurrection. Now, the first Jews, like Peter and them, Jewish Christians, actually still went to temple on Saturday, we're told in the book of Acts. And then on the other days of the week, Sunday and otherwise, they celebrated in their homes, the, the Eucharist. Now, Sunday had become the day of Christian worship, and then you have Domitian's thing happen, and John is exiled. So John can't celebrate the Mass anymore, the Eucharist. Um, he's by himself with one Roman guard, who I guarantee is not Christian, right? He's not a, he doesn't have his community. So in a way, it's kind of, it's kind of nice you know, that God gives him his experience, his vision, on the Lord's Day, on Sunday. So he does it on the day of the resurrection, on the day of Christian worship. So the whole vision is one day takes place in John's vision. Now, beyond that, um, what John sees is he sees Jesus in heaven dressed as a high priest. So you have the priestly things. He sees all these other priestly ministers wearing vestments of different kinds, just like he was used to both from Judaism and as the church was a, as becoming its own entity. He sees groups of consecrated virgins. Now, that's not going to be in Judaism. That's only from the church. And we already have that in Paul's letters that the virgins were actually the first, quote, religious order that was ever formed um, because they were a group, a recognizable group, and um, so they were given certain special religious duties since their marital duties were now ceased. So we have virgins, 144,000 of them. Um, they preside, all, everyone's presiding at an altar. There's a lampstand, which is the menorah. That's what the lampstand is. The, the menorah, if you don't know, is supposed to symbolize the tree of life. I told you that the temple is supposed to be an image of the whole creation. And so because the inner temple is Eden, you have the tree of life recognized by the light that comes off the seven branch menorah. So he sees the menorah, he sees all the incense and all the things going on, and he sees this prayer being offered by the angels and saints. Uh, it happens a lot. I only I combine two verses here just to sort of give you an example of it. But this also shows the intercession of the saints and angels. It's very important to, to look at what John is saying here. And clearly he's been Christian. Christ has been raised and glorified for over 60 years at this point. So this isn't John still hanging on to sort of weird old ideas or something. This is clearly part of the church. He says... Each of the elders, so that's a human being saint, one of the 24 elders, held a harp and gold bowls filled with incense. Now he tells us what the incense is, which are the prayers of the holy ones. That's our prayers. Another angel came and stood at the altar holding a gold censer. 
he was given a great quantity of incense to offer along with the prayers of all the holy ones. So the incense is, is the, our prayers. The smoke of the incense along with the prayers of the holy ones went up before God, right, he's on the throne, from the hand of the angel. So we have intercessory and petitionary prayer here. Those on earth, the holy ones, are praying our prayers, our works. The saints and angels intercede on our behalf. They present that to the Lord, and then God responds. The angel then takes the censer. He offers the prayer. Then he takes the censer, fills it with burning coals from the altar, and hurls it down to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake, symbols of divine presence. God is answering the prayers on earth. Notice, they went to heaven through the intercession of the angels and saints. God hears them. He responds to them on what happens. And then now there's going to be issues that occur on earth. Um, and that's a really important part that's kind of a focus of revelation. And the point is this. Human history is driven by the current state of the church's faith. That's what John is telling his people. Remember, his people are dying. And he's telling them, and all Christians for all generations, everything that's happening is God's will. There's nothing that can't be. An infinite God, there's nothing outside his will. That's why I don't like how some theologians talk about permissive and active. No, everything God does, God does knowingly. Right? The only area... The only area of life that we truly have freedom is on our personal, moral, and spiritual actions and decisions. That's it. And the, the Judaism was clear about this. There's a great Jewish story, and it talks about when every human person is conceived, God, the angel brings the, obviously it's a story, but it's telling us this, this religious truth. He brings that fertilized egg, and he places it before the Holy One. And God decides, will that person be strong or weak, wealthy or poor, this or that? The only thing God doesn't decide is whether he will have the fear of God or not. In other words, everything's predetermined, except whether you will choose to be saved or not. All we get is to respond to what's given. Everything is known beforehand and chosen. Right? I know we, we, we like to absolve God, but God doesn't care if, he, if we absolve him or not. And if you read the catechism, it's very clear. God is never responsible for sin, but he is responsible for physical evil. He's responsible. What does that mean? Every earthquake, every person who gets cancer, every tsunami, everything, those are not human choices. Does God know who will get it? Does he know who will be there and die? Yeah. Your life is set. The only determination is how will it end? We get to choose that. But not, we don't govern history. I know a lot of people don't like that, but it's okay. <laughs> if you think about it, it can't be any other way. God is infinite. He transcends everything. He created everything from nothing. And he is in everything. Whether you're saved or not, he's in us just by definition. He can't not be anywhere, and he guides everything. So John knows that, and that's why John is telling his people, look, we all know this is coming. Jesus told us we're going to be dying. Jesus told us this was going to happen. So don't fall away. Don't fall away. Right? You're being offered the choice. Life for, getting, for proclaiming publicly that you're not Christian, or death. He's telling them, you got to choose death, if that comes to you. And the idea is, if we really think about it, is this. On the surface, this sounds harsh, but it's actually comforting. Because think of people who either don't believe in God at all, or let's think of Christians or other believers of some sort, who believe in God but think God doesn't do things. Things just happen by chance. 
If that's the case, there's no help then. Right? If things just happen by chance, not because God chose it, there's no way out of them. Your life is just going to suck. But if even the bad things in life happen because it's God's will in order for you something to happen, then you have an answer and you move on. You might not know exactly why he did it, the answer, but you know he did it. You may not know, you may not like it, certainly, but you move forward because you know God's in charge and in the end, everything he's doing, even what seems bad right now, is for your benefit. And we never know why. You know, a, a lot of people have weird occurrences. Um, you know, someone will not get on an airplane because they just have a feeling, I'm just not supposed to get on the airplane. I don't know why. Or they won't get there in time because they accidentally slept in, right? Accidentally. Or their alarm didn't go off. God. <laughs> I can tell you how many times, you know, you'll, you'll, something will happen and then later on in, in the day I'll be like, I won't necessarily think it's about God. I'm not that religious. I wish I was. But my first thing is, oh, I'm glad that happened in the morning that I was really pissed off about because if it hadn't, then I would have this happened. So God works in these ways. The point being, though, God is in charge. Now, God, generally speaking, operates at three levels and they all have an order that is unbreakable, right? The natural law, the spiritual law, and the moral law. The natural law primarily is unbreakable. I mean, cause and effect, usually, that's what he promised Noah. He said, I'm not gonna do before the flood where I just did whatever I wanted. I'm gonna make things set so human beings know what to expect. So he says, summer, winter, rain, snow, the seasons will never be altered. His the general idea of being God says, I've, I've put natural laws in place. They're going to work. And so the truth is, 99.9% .9 of the time, the natural law inexorably happens. So vast majority of terminal patients die. Most soldiers captured by terrorists never coming home. That's just the reality of the natural world. The same thing, there are spiritual laws that are unbending. And one of them is, it's up to you in grace to determine alone whether you'll be holy or not. Your cooperation or lack thereof with God's grace is one of these determining laws. And then a lot of the other ones we, I mentioned, as above, so below, blah, blah, blah. And then the moral law, right? That's where we have our greatest power. Now, here's the funny thing, though, that John also tells us. All of this, all of this, does God ever break his law? John says, all the time. All the time. So now prayer becomes way more important. Right? And it's funny, it, it, um, in Judaism, and I think this is a really interesting thing. Um, I had the, anyway, it doesn't matter my background. But in Judaism, the model prayer for Judaism in the Bible is one that most people would not think of. They would point to maybe Abraham, the very first prayer uttered ever in the Bible, or Isaac, his son, or Jacob, his grandson, or any of these other great people. Maybe David in the Psalms, right? Nope. What is the greatest prayer model in Judaism? Hannah. Now, does anyone know who Hannah was? Samuel's mother. She is barren by nature, and she despises it. She hates it, and she wants a child. And Hannah is where the word chutzpah comes from, because Hannah doesn't accept the fate God gave her on any level. She says, yeah, you made me sterile. I want a kid, Lord. And not only do I want a kid, I want him to be a saint, Sadik. He'll be a priest I'll give you forever. And God says, yes. Right? Now what's interesting is if you go back and you look at Hannah's prayer, that's what the Virgin Mary copies in the Magnificat. The Magnificat is copied off Hannah's prayer. So the Blessed Virgin probably heard it proclaimed as it is at Rosh Hashanah every year and other times, and she 
follows the model of Hannah's prayer to in how she describes the world. And it's funny because Hannah's prayer tells us what God does in the natural order, and then the second half of this tells us how he changes everything. So you have this woman who gets everything she wants because she's bold. In that sense, she represents also the Canaanite woman in Jesus' ministry. Remember the poor Canaanite woman? Jesus, help me. My son is possessed by a demon. He wouldn't even look at her. Jesus. So she keeps yelling and yelling. The apostles say, send her away. She's a spectacle. She's embarrassing us. And the whole crowd's there. So as they're walking, Jesus is just silent. He's ignoring this poor woman because she's not Jewish. Right? He said, I'm not going to the non-Jews. That's for after. And then what does she do? Like Hannah, she comes up and she prostrates before him. So he can't move. He's literally stuck. Right? The apostles and the crowd are on all sides of him, and this woman lays down in front of him. And then on top to top it off, he still insults her. Right? He says, it's not good to take the food from the children. Now, don't be offended. It's what it literally says in Greek. He says, and throw it to the bitches. It's Jesus. That's what he says to her. Anyone remember her response? Even yeah, even the bitches have to eat. That's literally what she says. But she says, even the dogs eat the scraps. And what does Jesus do? Okay, granted. Did Jesus change his will? Yeah, he clearly didn't mean to do that when he saw her. He wasn't going to respond. And then he challenges her when she comes, and he kind of puts her on the defensive, or he, he, he makes the possibility, but she doesn't. Like Hannah, she just pours it out from the heart, and Jesus says, okay, it's done. So prayer is extremely powerful. And what we need to recognize what John is telling us is that everything that's happening on earth is in this dialogue between us and God. By our prayers and works, we petition the Lord for all these things, he hears it, he responds to that, and now events start to unfold on earth. And they don't unfold until we ask for them. Right? In a sense, we are the timetable ourselves. That's what Jesus tells the women when he's weeping. He says, pray that you don't have to undergo the tribulation. Well, why would he tell them that unless their prayers actually could mean they don't get to have to be in the tribulation? So we do affect those things. Simultaneously, he will also tell us, our lack of prayers and works thereof on earth will also have a response from heaven. God's going to interact with his world no matter what. He has chosen, and we've been chosen as the church, to kind of be the gateway or the way in which human history moves, a history already determined by God in the sense of the ultimate thing, but one in which we are responsible for how it plays out, when it plays out, how long it plays out, etc., based upon our response. And so one of the huge things of Revelation is this connection between our prayers on earth, the divine response in heaven, and the intermediaries, not just Christ who's the intermediary, but all of the angels and saints who partake in this, all this intercession and presence of the Blessed Virgin. We see the angels, we see Saint Gabriel in the book of Revelation. We have the, the saints highlighted throughout the, the apocalypse. Prayer, 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 and to understand that we are literally now sort of driving the history of the world towards its fulfillment. And so throughout the whole book of Revelation, everything we do as Catholics is found there. So if you turn to page five, and I record these all in the footnotes, but I don't want to go over all of them in detail, but the sign of the cross is there. We talked about that in the class that was just on the sign of the cross, but you have the seal of the living God that the name of Jesus put on the people's foreheads and you put the seal on them before the, the punishment comes of the earth. And all that reflects back to, remember, Ezekiel who put the Ta symbol, which is the cross, on those in Jerusalem who were saved from destruction. So the sign of the cross is there, just like at Mass. The glory is proclaimed, not in the exact same form we have it, but just glory to God in the highest over and over again in various ways as the angels and saints proclaim these things. The Alleluia, like we say before the gospel. The great Amen, 
there are several times where you have this, uh, just like where we do the great amen at the mystery of faith and such, they have these moments where we're told that um, all in heaven and earth responded with the amen. We've already mentioned the sanctus, the holy, holy, holy. That's first seen by Isaiah in chapter 6. The seraphim sing it. John sees it um, in uh, here. He goes, day and night, they do not pro stop proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come in Revelation 4. So all these, all the responses and liturgical things we think about, the church didn't just make these up over time. They were literally given them by John, so to speak, from heaven. The sursum corda, lift up your hearts, is that's John's call as he's first lifted up to experience revelation. You have repentance commanded by God. So we have the confidier. I confess to Almighty God and to you to be cleansed of all our sins. There's moments of contemplative silence. Now, a lot of, uh, to be honest, in today, at least the way that the Mass is practiced today, usually we don't leave a lot of time for silence, which is too bad because we should. There should be moments of silence, the Missal says, um, between the homily and starting the next phase. Um, after communion, rather than having a communion song, maybe it should be a time of quiet sometimes. Uh, but as the Mass is written, how, and it's, as it's supposed to be done correctly, uh, there are these moments of silence. And again, that follows from heaven. John will see something happen, then we're told, then there was a silence in heaven for half an hour, for this amount of time. There's antiphonal chant. Antiphonal chant is like we do in the Psalms. Someone sings a line, then we sing a line back, then they repeat this, and, and it goes back and forth. That's what antiphonal means, going back and forth between the two phonos. The, so we see the angels chanting and leading the people in song, and they respond, and then the angels respond with the same thing. So when we're praying the Psalms and a lot of our hymns, we see that going on. We see the priesthood of the faithful. We see all these kind of images that are, that are happening. And then... Um, after this, we're told, he says, I had a vision of a great multitude which no one could count from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne and before the Lamb wearing white robes holding palm branches. Notice that's even from Palm Sunday. In their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation comes from God, our God who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. And so um, then back to the book. This book has seven seals. And as I mentioned, there was, there was already, um, I, I talked about the book is already, a revelation is already divided nicely in half of the two parts of the mass. Another way you can see it is very interesting, is, is in its um, sevens that occur. You first have this, the seven seal book, so the seven seals. And then it, we're going to have the seven chalices later, filled with blood, just like the Eucharist. And then in between these two, uh, there's another, another set of seven, and that's seven trumpets. Now, we only have the slightest inkling, and it's usually in terms of... Um, usually used in terms of some kind of decorum or thing outside of battle. But modern military, we don't really have the understanding of the music and stuff. But, you know, in the, in the Civil War and even World War I and stuff, where you still had the trumpeteers who would, the various notes and things would call the people what to do. They would know, or the drummers, right? Everyone, it wasn't just to sing a song. All those things have meaning. So if it's this trumpet blast, the cavalry goes this way. If it's this one, well... Trumpets have the same, have a dual meaning in, in Israel from the very beginning. The first time they're ever mentioned in the Bible is uh, in, a, in an instant where they are both at one and the same time a military or a warfare image, but also a worship image. The first time they're ever mentioned is the story of um, the fall of Jericho. And if you remember the story, they're supposed to walk around the, the 
city seven times with the Ark of the Covenant in this worshipful state, playing the trumpets, and then on the seventh time when they've cleared the city, they're now supposed to blow all the seven trump the shofar, the trumpets all at once, and the, and the whole city's walls will collapse. And so it happens. The point being is what John is telling us is that um, there's another part to our Christian life as well. Worship leads to action, or it should. Or warfare, if we want to actually say it correctly. Worship leads to warfare. With who? <coughs> With the world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay? There's, there, that's why so many of the images in Revelation, apart from the historical fact that you're dealing with a lot of very violent times, the Jewish war, persecutions, but um, the image of warfare has been one from the beginning. One of the things I always find funny, it's strange to me about modern Western Christians, a lot of them, it doesn't matter whether they're Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, whatever, is the extent to which they think spirituality is sort of a fun, easy, simple thing to do, right? The images of spirituality or spiritual growth in the Bible are always rigorous. They're war, they're athletics, or they're survival. I mean, think about it. Think about the images. You have, you have Paul talking about boxing, running a race so as to win. Um, you have images of war and fighting the good fight. You have fighting the, the, the principalities and powers. I mean, we even have the term spiritual warfare. Surviving in a desert for 40 years, climbing up mountains, right? These are not simple things. In other words, spirituality isn't easy. Spirituality is hard. To really know and learn how to pray, to discipline yourself, to overcome with grace and cooperation with Lord's grace, your evil habits, your bad deeds, your things, that's difficult. And if anyone thinks it's easy, I guarantee it's because they're not doing it. They're lying to themselves. Spirituality is hard. And not only that, but the whole image of baptism has multiple things, like water always has multiple things in it. So we start our liturgical and Christian life, right? In the liturgical act of baptism, you pass through the waters. Now why? Well, one, waters have a long history, right? In the story of creation, God brings forth first these primordial waters, kind of the ideal idea of just matter, unformed matter, and he creates everything from that in Genesis. Then you have the great flood that destroys all that's evil and saves Noah. Then you move forward and you have um, the crossing of the Red Sea. Again, it destroys the evil Egyptians and it saves God's people. A lot of people don't know that happens a second time at the Jordan River, this time with Joshua. Joshua walks across the river in the, in the Jordan parts, and Israel walks into the Promised Land unimpeded. Uh, and then you have Jesus who turns water into wine. You have Jesus walking on water. Um, so the image, of, uh, there's, there, the image of water is good and bad, right? Water destroys what is evil and also gives life to what is good. So you go down into the water and you die and your sins are taken out. The evil is washed away, the destructiveness. And then you rise up out of it again, sort of already connected to Christ's revelation into this new life. Um, but there's also the image that most people forget that's important and that is behind the human, behind the human instruments of Jesus' death, who was really behind it all? Right? Who drove the Romans, the high priest, Judas, to do what they did? They listened. They have free will. But who drove them all? Satan. We're told Satan induced Judas. Satan did these things. Satan's the one who really destroys them. Now, the word... Um, This is the word in the Bible for where the demons live, the abyss. It's found in Revelation a lot of times. It's found in the story of Jesus on the lake. 
The abyss means water, right? Even today, we call the deepest portion of our planet, the deepest levels where humans can't go, the abyss. Demons are pictured as being in water. Why? Because water is chaotic. So it represents the early creation that chose not to accept God's path. So the demons are pictured in this watery looking chaos. That's why when Jesus is on his way across the lake in order to cast the demons out of the man at Ger the demoniac at Gerasene, remember the boat comes under attack and there's winds and stuff and everyone's, they're freaking out and they're like, Jesus, don't you care we're gonna die? And he was asleep and he finally stands up. He doesn't, it says something very interesting. It says he rebuked the winds and the sea and they went silent. Why would you rebuke non-living things? Because he wasn't rebuking those. He was rebuking the demons that were trying to kill him on his way to free men possessed by them. Because that's, that's how the rest of the story plays out. How many are there? Legion, for we are many. And then what does he do? He puts them in the pigs, and what happens to the pigs? They ironically are drowned in the very water they meant to kill Jesus with. The point being to all this, when you're in baptism, that's the beginning of warfare. When your parents, whether you know it, knew it or not, <laughs> baptized you, you entered into combat. You're now on God's side. You've passed through sin and hell and death, the power of the demons, just as Christ did, and come out the other side. But never think during this life that that's going to be just left to lie. You've declared yourself at war with them. And the, and the world they own and the hold they still have on you because of the flesh. So the whole trumpet imagery is part of Revelation as well, is that we have to realize that this, there's this warfare going on. And that warfare is sort of all-encompassing at the time that everything we do is, that's good. It doesn't have to be literal spiritual warfare in the, in the specific sense. Everything good we're doing is making the kingdom come closer and ending their hold on this world, right? That's our job. What are we? The church on earth is Jesus's beachhead. That's why we're called the church militant because we're the ones still at war with the devil. The other two aren't. The purgative have passed on. They're being perfected. The saints are now enjoying glory. We're the ones carrying out God's war to take back the world for the return of its actual king. And so during this war, anything we do that loosens the power of those fallen angels and the institutions, the cultures, the, everything they've created can only help to continue to draw the kingdom closer. That's why it's very odd if you think about it, the very name we give our worship We called the whole service the Mass over the very last line that's actually stated. Ite misa est. Go, you are sent. You've just worshipped, now go. Misa is from the word mission. So you've now received the body and blood of Christ. You've gotten your glimpse of heaven, your experience. Now remember what you're fighting for and go out and begin to conquer this world with love, right? with the things that Christ teaches us. So there's this, this huge battle going on, and we see that through the battle that we don't stand alone by any means. The power of Christ, of course, but even on a lesser level, the virgin is always there with us. And we have the whole chapter about the Blessed Virgin, who also is representative of the church. We have the story of uh, the angels and St. Michael who can defeat Satan at any time by their power. We have the 24 elders constantly praying for us. We have the angels who are interceding for us. In other words, we can't lose, really. We just have to be willing to take up the mantle and say, we'll do it. And what that really just means isn't that abstract or hardcore. It really simply means, do you really live the gospel authentically? Or do you pick and choose and just do those parts that you like or that are easy? That's all God's asking. 
He's not asking us to do more than he ever asked us. He's just doing, he's just telling us, you just got to do what you're supposed to do. And so many don't. That was the whole formation of the Franciscan order I belong to, right? Franciscans, we have no mission, right? We're not a teaching order. We're not a preaching order. We're not involved in, well, we can be involved, but we're, as an order, we're not a ministry of, of uh, teachers or education. We are not involved in hospitals or healing. So what do the Franciscans do? The Franciscans are there to live the entire gospel so that they can encounter God personally in this life, vis viscerally, personally, at any cost except sin. And how do they do that? By living the gospel. And that's when, when he was asked that, when Francis was asked that by uh, Cardinal um, Hugo, Hugolo. When the Cardinal asked him, he says, well, what is your, what is your order's you know, charism? And he said, to live the holy gospel of Jesus Christ in poverty, chastity, obedience. And the cardinal said, well, how are you a new order? Doesn't every religious order and every Christian live the gospel? And Francis' answer was, none of them do that I've met. Not a single person. They live the parts they like or that are easy or that their culture accepts. But the whole gospel, they don't even try. Right? We're kind of lazy. <laughs> we want the least common denominator way into heaven. I, I remember, I know that's kind of a funny thing to bring up, but uh, you probably won't hear Simpsons being a, the Simpson shows being a thing for the religious teaching, but there is a great episode where Homer dies and he goes to heaven. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's actually really funny. He's at the gate in the big line. And he comes up, of course, St. Peter, and everyone's telling their names, and he goes, Homer Simpson. And he's like, he flips the book and he looks and he goes, you're not in here. And he's all, check again. <laughs> so he's like, look, check again, like three times, like check again. He's like, look, you're not in here. And he goes, come on, me and the big guy are like this. And he goes, the big guy? He goes, you know, and he doesn't even know his name. He goes, Jeebus? <laughs> and and St. Peter's like, oh. and then he like goes off for a moment and he comes back and he, he tells Homer, he goes, you know, he, the Lord is in his mercy has decided he's going to send you back to earth. And if you do one deed, one good deed, you'll be all right to go when you die later down in history. And he's like, thank you. So he, he appears and like the kids are outside fighting. You can see them through the window and his wife is doing dishes. And he appears and he's like, Marge, I have to do a good deed to get back to heaven. And she's like, well, you can go help with the kids. Why don't you like put on the dinner while I'm trying to, and she like names like four pretty basic things, right? And he goes, whoa, whoa. He goes, I'm just trying to get in. I'm not going for sainthood. Like, <laughs> but I heard on a more like uh, non-comical level, but it is interesting. I heard Ralph uh, Martin, an excellent Catholic teacher. He said once, you know, we have to strive for the best, right? We really have to, as Christians, that's what God is always asking us always to give more because we never really give our whole or we think we've given our whole and realize there's more to us. And he's given us everything he is. And then he, he's wanting us to respond because that response makes us more joyful, more loving, etc. It's not because he's just like seeing how well we do. But that's why we really need to shoot for that. And of course, you know, part of the reason some people don't follow the whole gospel is they don't know it all. So part of it is as you're listening to homilies, as you're reading, as you're praying, you know, asking God to reveal these things so you can start to take it up. But it does have to be this. We have to realize we're going for sainthood. And uh, Ralph Martin put it this way. He goes, you know, we all need to shoot for heaven. Because the reality is, if we miss, thank God, God in his mercy has this catch net. <laughs> it's called purgatory, right? Not so bad for hell, but not good enough yet in order to enter the perfection that is heaven. He goes, but if you're just mediocre, if you're shooting for purgatory and you miss that, he's just like, <laughs> right? So it behooves us to try to, to try to make that jump. So all this imagery, though, we see, we're coming down to our end, the chalices, the book, the Eucharist, the Lamb of God, all these images, as well as all the hymns, the songs, these are what the, the church literally used to create the mass. 
Now, God always does supernaturally what he also does naturally in the sense that he gives it to us from every angle so we can't miss it. So, for example, when he, he made Saul king, he did it secretly. He said, Samuel, go anoint Saul, tell everyone he's king. So it happened. So he's already king. But then Saul isn't moving forward for king, so God, through natural means, makes it clear that Saul has to be king. So what I, why I'm bringing this up is, um, what we see is that um, the Mass, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and the Liturgy of the Word, they do have a, a historical background as well that doesn't take away from the religious one. Right. The first part of the Mass with the readings, the cantor, all the stuff, that's really taken from the synagogue worship that was known to the people of Jesus' time, right? You didn't go to the temple to hear the Bible read. That wasn't done at the temple. The temple sacrifice. If you wanted to hear the Torah read, you went to the synagogue, and it was proclaimed. There would be a reading from the prophets, a psalm, and then a reading from the Torah. So same way we do Old Testament, psalm, gospel. You would have the preaching, and that would be the end of it. Then the Eucharist is really based on two things, and it revolves around that name, the Lamb of God. Now the easy one that most of us pick out is this one, Passover. And in a very small portion of the Mass in the Liturgy of the Eucharist, that's true. It's clearly Passover. Last Supper was Passover. If you know anything about Judaism, though, or read the Old Testament, there's a problem with Passover and Jesus in the sense that Passover has nothing to do with forgiving sins. There is one other sacrifice, though, that only has to do with forgiving sins that also uses a lamb. The Day of Atonement. So by calling Jesus the Lamb of God, it's purposely sort of being vague in the sense that it relates to both of these. This is delivery from the evils of Pharaoh and Egypt. So that's our escape from the world and its Lord, the devil. And we're brought out of his world into the world of the church. However, that's not the forgiveness of sin. That aspect of Jesus comes from the lamb that was uh, uh, killed on behalf of the people that the priest put his hands on to indicate he represented all, every Israelite, and all of their sins are placed on that lamb, and they, are, they die. Now, so there were, there were things that the church had that helped it create the structure, but ultimately the structure is what John sees. And so from the furniture we use, which go back at least to the first century, we found one of the oldest house churches, fully intact almost, in Edessa. And when they dug it out, they didn't think it was a house church. It's just a house. And then the living room has been converted into a church. It has a bema, the altar. It has the ruins of what would have been where the book was read from. It has inscriptions all around it with images of the fish, the cross, etc. Um, the only thing it... it um, Oh, and it even has the throne where you're sitting at. So here you have, all the way back to the first century, we know that that, had, that resonated. Um, the other thing is the Mass, like I said, has been untouched from the beginning. And in the Catechism, I just want to read this to you, and then we'll have a last closing comment in our closing prayer. But one thing about the, the Mass is it goes back very far. Now, in the Catechism... If you want to look this up yourself, it's number 1345, 1345. St. Justin Martyr, who's writing in the year 155. So this is only 55 years, roughly, after the death of John. He is writing to the Emperor Antonin, Antoninus, who's pagan, in order to explain that Christians are not cannibals or these other weird things that people are saying about them. And so he describes the Mass. Now, he won't describe all of it, because in those days, you weren't, outsiders were not allowed to see the Mass. But listen how he describes it and how much nothing has changed for us as Catholics. This goes back to the year 155. Revelation was about 60 years before that. On the day we call the Day of the Sun, Sunday, all who dwell in the city or country gather in one place. The memoirs of the apostles and the writings of the prophets are read as much as time permits. So there you have the Old Testament reading, New Testament reading. 
When the reader has finished, the presider over those gathered admonishes and challenges them to imitate the beautiful things they have heard, homily. Then we all rise together and offer prayers for ourselves, for all others, wherever they may be, so that we may be found righteous by our life and actions and faithful to the commandments and obtain eternal salvation. So there's the prayer of the faithful, praying for all the different needs. When the prayers are concluded, we exchange the kiss, sign of peace. Then someone brings bread and water and a cup of, a cup of water and a cup of wine, mix them together to the one who presides. And you still see that, right? The priest pours the water into the wine. He takes them, he offers praise and glory to the God of the universe through the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and he gives thanks to God, the Eucharistic prayer, the term give thanks means, that we have been judged worthy of these gifts. When he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving, all present together by voice acclaim amen, so the great amen. When he has given thanks, the people have responded, Amen. Those we call deacons then give to those present the Eucharisted bread, wine, and water. So, communion. But even to this point, it was true, the Mass has never changed. Then, the deacons take them to those who are absent. Communion of the sick, 155 A.D. So when you realize the next time you go to Mass, and it just seems like the same old, same old, boring thing with slightly different readings, recognize that one, the Mass isn't really for you. The Mass is for you to worship God in the way that he wants to be worshiped as he even has the angels worship. And that every step you take in that Mass, as boring as it may be, as, as babies crying, homilies, whatever else, you are literally at that moment in the presence of heaven. All your deceased relatives, the angels, the saints, the Blessed Mother, Jesus, risen, uh, crucified and risen, the Spirit connecting us all, and God the Father being offered all these things. See, the Mass for a brief moment in time does what God will do at the end of time. When he comes in the second coming, Paul tells us, everything will be transformed, New heaven, new earth, it'll be united as one. The heavenly city coming down, Jerusalem, to unite with earth. God will be all in all. And that's exactly what happens in miniature at the Mass. God becomes all in all. The Spirit unites us all. We then take communion of which we all become. We take the little body of Christ and become united together as the body of Christ. And God is all in all. Just for a short time but it's real, and it's pointing towards what's coming. The reason that we call Sunday the Lord's Day is that's the name given in the Old Testament for the Day of Judgment, the Day of the Lord, because Christ comes to us every single time. And as Christians, we shouldn't be afraid of the last judgment. We should be joyful when it comes, because it means everything now is being restored. So the Mass is a miniature action of what is God is going to do one day to everything in a way that we can all experience firsthand. Right now it's still sacramentally, so we don't, quote, see it. But the truth is, the more you become devoted to the Mass, the more you pay attention and prepare for it, the more you then take that Mass into your own daily life and prayers and try to live it out, the more that that Mass does come alive and the more you do see God at work in there and you feel that connection and you understand it better between the angels, the saints, you and everything that's going on. So, you know, try to keep that in mind um, of the great thing that has been given to us in the mass. All right, there's no class next week because of the holiday and I don't wanna have a class for one and not the other because that throws off the schedule. <laughs> for those who are interested to go on, um, that came from my overall teaching on the sacraments. So the next one in two weeks will be, uh, I'll start the sacraments, which will probably be three classes and that'll be the end. The first night, first time in two weeks, we'll talk about the sacramentals, things like holy water, rosaries, Eucharist, blessed salt, blessed oil, and all those. And then the next two will be the sacraments. And when I say sacraments, I mean in general. 
Like, why do we even have sacraments? What do the sacraments do? Why do we use them? I'm not going to go in detail over every one of the seven sacraments. I'm just giving us the main sort of understanding of that part of our faith. Oh, all right. So <laughs> let's go ahead and again, just kind of let ourselves just refocus ourselves on the Lord. And I know it was a fire hose, but I had to do it in one day. So <laughs> in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. almighty and ever eternal God, we come together before you, Lord, and we thank you for the great gift that you have given to your church in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Lord, as Catholics, we have always been taught that we receive the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord in communion, and that is a great gift. But we also now appreciate more so the fact of what the Mass is doing, that we are literally being joined into the heavenly liturgy, surrounded by the angels and saints, shoulder to shoulder with our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our grandparents, our friends, all those who have gone before us marked with the sign of faith. And for that moment, as Paul says, neither death nor life nor anything can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord, to understand that in that mass, we are entering into heaven to stand in your presence. We are being allowed to stand before the very throne of God and that we ask that you just continue to bless us, to increase the knowledge of your love for us in the Mass and in our minds, and help that then become a zealousness in our heart to carry out your gospel in the world, to usher in what small way each of us can the closer coming of our kingdom, the kingdom which only you in the end can oversee and establish but which you have called upon each of us to do our part. Lord, we know you control all things, and that gives us peace and consolation, knowing that no matter what happens, anything and everything that happens has been done for our good so that ultimately we may be perfected and enjoy that same relationship that the angels and saints enjoy with you now, ourselves one day in heaven and beyond that, in the great kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys. Hope it didn't blow your minds too much. Huh? Yes, <laughs> <We> always do. <laughs> <laughs>